Hey everybody, welcome to the channel, True Crime Stories. If you're new to the channel, please hit that like button and subscribe so you can hear more. Thanks for stopping by. sunny section of Mount Pleasant Cemetery in London, Ontario. Grass that is green and brown in patches grows over a flat headstone that simply reads Helga Beer, 1936-1968. Helga has been dead longer than she lived. Half a century later, her premature death still goes unanswered. Who killed her? Helga was a 31-year-old divorcee and a native of Germany. She had moved to London, Ontario seven years before her death. She had just recently divorced her husband and was living in an apartment with her mother and brother. She seemed to be adapting well to single life, and she had gotten a job as a hairdresser in a, part, in a popular department store and had an active social life. On the evening of August the 5th, 1968, Helga had gone out with some friends after work. They had gone to a couple of bars around town, and afterwards they went to an apartment building where Helga had had previously lived, and she had a friend who still lived in that apartment building. So they end up at this apartment of this friend. The party continued through the night, but sometime during the night, witnesses say that the friend who lived there was seen leaving, carrying a suitcase. It was believed that she had gotten into an argument with the man that she shared the apartment with and left. This woman wasn't able to be found when the police started doing um, investigating the death of Helga Beer. So it's just assumed that she'd moved away, moved out of the area, or 1968 people didn't have, there wasn't a whole lot of way to find people. They didn't have internet or cell phones or anything, but. Sometime after 1 a.m., Helga was seen leaving the apartment with a man who witnesses described as being a white male in his probably early 30s. They said he had dark hair, he was an average height, and husky build. Many of the witnesses remarked about one distinguishing feature. They said the man had a very wide set nose and that his face was very round. The following morning at approximately 6.30 a.m., an employee at the service station on Carling Street noticed a 1963 Volkswagen Beetle backed into a parking space on the property. Not sure where the car came from, the attendant looked into the windows and saw what he first, what he first thought to be a mannequin. It was stuffed between the space, between the front and back seats. He opened the door and quickly realized that he was staring at a human body. Now this was the body of Helga Beer. Helga had been severely beaten in the face with a fist and then strangled. When she was found, she was wearing only a blouse and bra. The rest of her clothing was thrown around the interior of the car. Though an autopsy revealed that she had had sexual intercourse, it was unclear whether it was forced. Well, she had worked all that day, so she had been at work for the biggest part of the day, and after work she had been with her friends for many hours, and then afterwards she went to this party and ended up leaving with this man. Um... I would just assume that it probably was forced because of the beating that she had taken. And so that's just what I'm going to go with, that it was, a, it was a rape. 
Authorities were able to determine that Helga had likely been killed elsewhere and then driven to this spot, where she was crammed into the car half-nude, perhaps because her killer had wished to humiliate her. The service station where the vehicle was abandoned was only a little more than 500 yards from the apartment where Helga had last been seen. There was a composite sketch of the man who had been seen with Helga that night, but people say that it was too generic to really lead to any particular suspect. Although police could have obtained at least a blood, blood sample from Helga, Helga's assailant, since semen was found inside her body as well as on a pair of her underwear left in the front seat, Investigators, for some reason, failed to perform a fairly simple task of collecting this evidence. The only thing that they were able to determine was that the perpetrator had type O blood. This later drew criticism for the lack of diligence on the part of the detectives. They were seen as being neglectful to collect any evidence, despite the fact that so many of these murders had taken place. But they probably weren't looking at it like this was a serial killer at that time. They were probably looking at it as being unrelated to the other cases. Because, like I said, Helga was slightly older than the other people. And they probably just thought that possibly... She had gone out with this man. He had tried to make a move on her. She rejected him, and he became angry and raped her and beat her. But either way, they should have tried a little harder to collect evidence. They allowed persons of interest to leave the city or even the country without taking plans to stay in contact with them. So they must have had someone in mind that they thought might have been a suspect. Because of this slipshod investigation, it is uncertain whether Helga Beer fell victim to the same killer who had murdered Jacqueline Dunleavy. The specific manner that the two bodies were presented out in the open and in sexually humiliating positions would seem to indicate a signature of sorts, and it was even speculated that they may have been a link to the murder of Frankie Jensen and Scott Leishman, who were also victims who had been found with their lower clothing removed. Now, every one of these people, except, well, Jacqueline Dunleavy, was still wearing a skirt, but it was pulled up, and her legs were positioned in a way to expose her um, and her shirt had been ripped open to expose her. And both of the boys had been found with their paints and underwire removed. And now Helga Beer had been found with her paints removed. At any rate, it appeared that authorities were not quite as motivated to apprehend the killer of a 30-something-year-old woman who was a divorcee as they had been to try to capture the killer of young children. Well, they hadn't been too diligent in trying to capture those people either because all these years later, none of these cases have been solved. Beer was, Helga Beer was soon forgotten in the wake of an even more baffling homicide that would transpire later in the city. In November of 1968, yet another young woman would go missing in London, Ontario. It doesn't say a whole lot more about Helga. It just says she had moved to London from Germany, settling in London, Ontario with a brother. And she worked during the day as a hairstylist at the Elizabeth Arden Beauty Salon in Simpson's Department Store in downtown. At night, she spent time with friends, going to restaurants, bars, or hanging out at their apartments. She also spent time with her mother and brother, with whom she lived. Now, the night she was me went missing, the night she was out with her friends, she had run into someone that she knew. As they were about to go into another bar on King Street, this group of friends was 
getting ready to walk into this bar, and Helga ran into someone she knew and began to talk to them. The friends also say that he had, um, he was very fluent in English and didn't seem to have much of an accent at all. So could he have been an American? I mean, this is very close to America, very close to the border. Helga and the man stayed about a half an hour, and, um, her friends didn't seem to be worried when she left with him because they seemed to know each other very well and she seemed to be very comfortable with him. Now, the parking lot attendant says that Helga was found... Now, the way I'm picturing this is that her body was positioned between the front and the back. And if you've ever rode in a Volkswagen... um. Her upper body, her torso, was in the back, and her legs were spread open in the space between the two front seats. Now, this is kind of the way it was described. Um, she was naked from the waist down. She'd been beaten to death and strangled. The police believe that she was murdered somewhere else and brought and put into that car but I wonder if it was that maybe she was in her car and the man got in the car with her maybe she was offering to give him a ride home or maybe they were going to go somewhere and he attacked her and she tried to get into the back seat to get away from him maybe he raped and murdered her right there between those seats and strangled her to death and then got out of the car and left her there maybe she wasn't posed maybe that's just the way that she died and that's the way that he left her there was some evidence kept in Helga's case despite what was considered to be shoddy police work they did actually keep some materials, they kept her clothing and other articles, and they did find samples that they have tested over these years, looking for a DNA match since the, you know, development of uh, these types of forensics like DNA. They haven't made a match to anyone yet. They say that the material has been tested three times, and there's very little left. Others say, why not go on ahead and test it? What do they have to lose? Now, Detective Alex Krigsman wonders if Helga was killed by someone in the apartment that night. He said that the man who had lived in that apartment had left the country shortly after her death. Um, he had been spoken to by the police and interviewed, and later didn't really consider him a suspect, so he was allowed to leave. And I don't know if they know who that man is, if he's still alive today, if they have information on him. Um, her car and her body was found 500 yards from that apartment. Police did say that they believed that she had been killed elsewhere and put in her car and brought to that spot so it's possible could it have been possible that when she left the apartment that night with that man they went their separate ways and she returned to the apartment looking for her friends who maybe by this point had left and the man offered to let her come in maybe he was the one that raped and murdered her and um, took her body out there and disposed of it in the car Now, while it's not mentioned here, it kind of caught my attention, and I wondered if the man that they were talking about who lived in this apartment was her ex-husband. The reason I wonder about that is because it says that Helga once lived in this apartment building. It also says that sometime during the night after this group of Helga and her friends arrived at this apartment building, the woman that lived there packed up her suitcase and left. Did she get into an argument with this man because Helga, who was his ex-wife, shows up at his home with her friends? Could this have been what this was about? Because later, when the police were investigating, trying to find out who killed her, 
they spoke to the man that lived in the apartment and they never did name who he was. I went back through some websites looking to see if anybody had left comments about that, but I couldn't find it. But it, it, it made me curious if this could have been her ex-husband because they said he was allowed to leave the country and left. So I don't know if her ex-husband was still in Germany, if she left and came to Canada to be with her family, or if the two of them came to Canada together and then divorced. My own personal thoughts on this is that this has nothing to do with the other cases. I think that it was pro probably more than likely the man that she left the apartment with that night. I think she'd had a little bit too much to drink. He offered her a ride home once he got her away from the apartment and away from her friends. He probably attempted to have sex with her. She may have rejected him, and he beat her to death and murdered her in the in the um, committing this rape. And then he returned her body back to her car. Now, that's one thought. And I also think it's a good possibility that she may have returned to the apartment that night Maybe she ditched this guy, wanted to go back and find her friends, and encountered someone else. But either way, her case is unsolved as well. I'm going to move on to the next case now, is 19-year-old Linda White. 19-year-old Linda White had just moved to London from her native Burlington to attend Western University College. She lived in a rented house on Argyle Street that she shared with some roommates who also happened to be her old classmates from high school. Though the residence was about a half an hour walk from campus, Linda enjoyed living there with her friends. It also helped that she was very near the home of her typing tutor. As winter descended, though, Linda got in the habit of catching a ride to and from class with two boys she knew who lived nearby. They would usually drop her off at her tutor's place, which was only two blocks away from her house. On November 13, 1968, Linda had just completed a French midterm at around 7 p.m. and asked some of her friends if they wanted to go out to blow off some steam at a nearby tavern. No one wanted to go, so Linda just got into the car with the two friends who she usually caught a ride with. They dropped her off, they said, and watched her walk away into the early evening. Later that night, Linda's roommates decided to go out, and they went around to some different pubs, but Linda wasn't there. She wasn't in any of the pubs that they went to. At first, they wondered maybe if they had just missed her, but later they thought she had probably just decided to return home. However, the next morning, the friends started to become concerned when there was no hint of her anywhere, so her roommates called her brother John, who drove a 100 miles from Burlington to help look for her. They searched the entire campus and all around the neighborhood, but they could find no sign of Linda. Attempting to cover all the bases, John White, her brother, went to the nearest London train station and showed the man at the ticket booth a photograph of his sister. The man told him that Linda had just gotten on the train bound for Toronto, but when John jumped on the train to search for her, he didn't see her anywhere. So either the man had just mistaken Linda for someone else, or he just told him this for some reason. In the meantime, Linda's parents had arrived, and they began to help search. They searched the house once again. This time, they discovered something that they had all missed earlier. Several pieces of Linda's clothing had been balled up and then shoved underneath the comforter on her bed. The clothing didn't appear to be damaged or stained or in any way out of sorts, but it was just odd that this was something that Linda had never done before. It was almost like that someone had tried to conceal the clothing. Finally, the White family went to report Linda missing. It had been 24 hours since she had last been seen, 
and despite the rash of crimes taking place in the city over the previous months, the police did very little to search for her, and they didn't seem to be very alarmed. They assumed that Linda had just went away with some friends or had decided to just go away on her own. Linda's fate would remain undetermined for four and a half years. Her remains were found in 1973 in a tobacco farmer's field, about 70 kilometers from where she was thought to have disappeared. She was just a skeleton in the woods. 45 years after her disappearance, the mystery of Linda White's slaying and discovery gets the attention of a celebrity team of investigators. The, now, this, what they're talking about is her case was featured on a TV show called To Catch a Killer that is on the OWN network. And this involves this police officer, Michael Artfield, who wrote this book about these murders. White was a student at Western University, and she vanished after writing a midterm exam. Her body was found four years later, in a wooded area in Norfolk County. The body of 19-year-old Linda White was found in a shallow grave in a bush lot five years after she went missing. Her body was fully skeletonized and one of her arms was missing. Now this, is, this will come back in some of the other stories later on that some of the body parts were missing. They don't know. By applying knowledge of the decomposition process, animal activity, and other environmental factors, it was determined that her body was not at the site for the full five years. I did watch the um, episode of To Catch a Killer that was based on her story. And I want to talk a little bit about what I, I took down some notes from that, and I'm just going to read from them. Linda vanished in 1968 from the campus of Western Ontario in London, Ontario. Her remains were, now they say her remains were found in a tobacco field, but that wasn't the case. Her clothing was found five years later, in 1973, her clothing was found in a field and um, they don't know if they'd been tied around a pole or wrapped around a pole or if the wind had blown them there. But then a month later, and I guess once they found these clothing, they started searching for her once again. I don't know. But it was just said that she was found down a lonely dirt road. And the reason they say that is because the local people there say very few people know about this place. So it had to have been someone who was familiar with that road, knew it was there, and um, knew that the times of day to go out there and stuff when there wouldn't have been any people around. And so her body was found. They thought at first she was in a shallow grave, but once the forensics came out and the when when this Michael Artfield and his team started making this uh, documentary about her case, they did some research of their own and the anthropologist says they don't believe she was actually in a shallow grave but just that her body had been laying out maybe the the ground was damp and muddy and wet and eventually her body just kind of sank into the dirt but they believe she was just covered over with some leaves and dirt and debris maybe some brush that was laying around her body was um, positioned now they said that she was missing her right arm and another detail about her was that she always wore a medic alert bracelet. And the medic alert bracelet was nowhere around. They, they brought out um, metal detectors and they searched and they looked and they tried to find any traces of anything, but they couldn't. But her right arm was gone and this would have been the arm that she would have had the bracelet on. Her body was positioned, they said, laying out in a way as... Um, her body was laying with her, with her arms straight out and her legs open and spread out in different directions. And they thought this was a ritual, type of ritual killing. 
Um, probably just this killer was uh, alone with the body, had more time on this dark road and nobody around so that he could take time to, you know, pose this body. The young men that gave her a ride said that they often picked her up and dropped her off at the corner in front of this apartment building and this was where they assumed that she lived. But this was actually not where she lived and it was in a different kind of it was close by to where she lived but it was a little farther away a few blocks away but they said that they often picked her up and dropped her off in front of this place now some of her roommates and friends said that she went there for typing tutoring but they don't they couldn't find out who lit they sent a researcher out to try to find out who may have lived there if there had been any records kept um this was a college town, and most of the homes there were occupied by college students or people that worked at the college. The investigators say that they do believe the removal of her arm was deliberate, and it's possible that they had planned to remove all of her limbs. Um, maybe they just found it to be a little bit more difficult than they thought or time-consuming. This was all there was about Linda. Um, they do believe that she may possibly have been a victim of the same person who killed a couple of other women in the area, and I'm going to bring those names up in the next video. I appreciate everyone for taking the time to hear this out, and I watched a podcast earlier today about a woman who was talking about these same cases, and she said that there was no way that she could cover each and every one of them because it would have taken forever, and I agree. There's so many. It's it's unreal how many people died and were murdered in the area between the 50s and the 80s. Patricia was 22 years old and a newly separated mother with two small children at home, Clifford and Kevin. In many ways, her murder was somewhat reminiscent of the August 1968 killing of Helga Beer another newly single young woman who was trying to get back out into the dating scene. On the evening of April the 22nd, 1969, Patricia was home with her two boys in their one-bedroom apartment on King Street. The following day, which was a Thursday, a friend of Patricia's found her apartment in the early afternoon but received no reply. He decided to stop by and check on her and the children. Inside the apartment, he discovered a gruesome scene. Patricia Bowen was lying on the floor in a huge puddle of blood. She'd been stabbed at least a dozen times in the chest. Her two children were crying and hungry, and they were physically unharmed. However, they hovered near the body, terrified. A search of the apartment by the police turned up no signs of forced entry and no evidence of robbery. Although some of the furniture had been knocked over or moved around, investigators determined that the two small boys had done this while trying to climb up into the cabinets to search for food. It appeared that Patricia had been asleep on the sofa when someone entered through her front door and began stabbing her. A bloody pillowcase recovered from the nearby front hallway strengthened the theory that this had been the killer's entry point. Despite the viciousness of the murder, it was established that Patricia had not been sexually assaulted. In the earlier case of Helga Beer, investigators seemed to assign less urgency to solving the murder of a newly single woman who collected welfare benefits and had recently began dating a new man. The police didn't seem to put too much effort into searching for her killer. They did come up with one or two promising leads. They did believe that it may have been Patricia's ex-boyfriend who committed suicide shortly after her learning about her death. Well, to interject my own personal thoughts here, I would say, where was the ex-husband, the father of these two children? That would be my first 
because I don't know how long they had been separated or divorced. I don't know how long he had, if maybe he had moved on and found someone new or if he'd found out she was dating again and became jealous. A more intriguing scenario suggested that Patricia Bovin had possibly fallen victim to the same killer who had murdered 32-year-old London woman named Victoria Mayo. Victoria, just like Patricia, had been violently stabbed to death in her home while her young child was there but was unharmed. But in both cases, there was no robbery or rape and both of their homes were less than three miles apart. A man named Sandor Fulop, F-U-L-E-P, confessed to killing Victoria Mayo in October of 1967, but because of his mental disability, he was placed in a psychiatric facility for a short time before being released. In 2000, DNA evidence from his body, exhumed body proved that he definitely had murdered Victoria, leaving open the possibility that he may also have been responsible for murdering Patricia Bovin. Did they take samples of any type of blood samples, or, or was there other types of uh, fingerprints or anything found at Patricia's crime scene that would maybe lead back to this man that confessed to killing this Victoria and later DNA did say that he was her killer um, I don't know I, I didn't see anything about that Patricia Bowen was murdered when she was only 22 years old she lived on King Street in London, Ontario, with her two children. Patricia's children were aged one and three at the time that their mother was murdered. They were found sobbing, dirty, and hungry, covered in their mother's blood um, in the apartment where their mother had been murdered. The front door that accessed a staircase was unlocked, and a neighbor found a pillowcase covered in blood in front of the building. Did they keep this pillowcase? Why did the killer take the pillowcase? Did they use it to wipe blood from their hands? Therefore, the front door was probably the entry point. There was no sign of forced entry. This leads them to believe that Patricia... Now, they said Patricia was asleep on the couch. But if she got up to open the door for someone, maybe she sat down on the couch because she was comfortable with this person. The apartment was in disarray and chairs and other items were scattered around, but police believe children, the children, now this was a one-year-old and a three-year-old. The three-year-old possibly could have moved a chair, but I don't think the one-year-old was moving furniture. Patricia had been stabbed over a dozen times in her torso. She had no defensive wounds. It seems that the, that the one thing that keeps coming up here in all of these cases is that any suspect always seemed to have some connection to a mental hospital. It seemed as though these people could commit a crime, a heinous murder of a young child or a young woman, and go commit themselves into a mental hospital and get away with it, it almost seems, because they would stay in the hospital for a little while. It was like as long as they were in this hospital, they were protected and the police didn't really pursue them and they would get out of the hospital. Did the police then look at them as though they were cured or were they ever even on their radar? Uh, in all these, almost all these cases, mentally ill. Now, this man named Sandor Philippe, whose name comes up in the murder of Patricia Bovin, he had confessed to murdering a woman named Victoria Mayo, and 
they believe it was the same person because it was in the same neighborhood and it was the same type of murder. They, he, the person had come into their home and stabbed them to death, stabbed them multiple times inside their homes. And this was not the um, way that these other serial killer um, operated. He, in the other cases, in the cases of Jacqueline Dunleavy and all these others, almost all these others, they were picked up and um, given a ride somewhere and found murdered. And so they don't think that he was the serial killer of all these other people. But this theme, this, this mental illness seemed to be a scapegoat that the police used to avoid um, really digging into these cases. Like I said previously, they didn't really put a whole lot of effort into those either. Had it not been for this detective, Dennis Alsop, who kept all of these boxes and boxes of notes and pictures and uh, interview reports that he you know collected over the years on all of these cases and kept them um they probably wouldn't have solved some of the crimes that they have solved but i appreciate your time and thanks for watching